Alleluia, Alleluia, He is risen. Morning has broken. He is risen indeed. <laughs> and we are your consecrated hosts. I am Jonathan, consecrated by baptism. Father Jeff, consecrated by holy orders. You're, it's Easter! It is Easter. You it are in a good mood. It's solemn. We are in a, the solemn octave of Easter. We should chant the entire morning show today. For the sake of his sorrowful passion and the <laughs> sake of the people in, watching. We are we done with the sorrowful passion, so we don't want to inflict that upon anyone no. today. No, no. Here we are. <laughs> well, happy Easter, Jonathan. Happy I hope Easter. We had a great celebration. Yeah, it was, it was good. We, we did. It was warm. It was warm, which was a gift from God. Oh, those last days of Holy Week, I was like, "Are you kidding me?" Yeah, going back into the the winter that that helps set the mood, I suppose. Yeah, cold and dark. <laughs> well, it was sunny. It was sunny. It was just chilly. but I'm chilly. <clears throat> we tried to do the Holy Thursday, Good Friday. We didn't do the vigil yet. But well, that's, we, we I want to thank you up. for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're working our way up. Yeah, let those kids get a little older and more settled before yeah. we bring them to the two and some odd hour thing. Yeah, it, it was it, long. It was a long haul. It, yeah. Oh my gosh. I had this dream. Uh, I think it was Wednesday night into Holy Thursday. So I must have had all of these things rolling around in my head. And I had this dream that I was in somebody's house. And Bishop Lopes was there, my, my friend. And then, like, the Schraders who do music, you know, they were singing. And we were going to have, we were going to have Holy Thursday Mass in this house. And so we were setting everything up. And then people kept, you know, it was the Easter Vigil. And, like, the lights were on. And, like, halfway through the first reading, I realized, who didn't turn off the lights? So I went over and I shut off the lights. And then, like, the musicians or someone decided to turn them back on again. And I'm like, for the love. And then I went and I went and turned them off again. And we got through like three or four readings. And then all of a sudden I realized it's not Easter. It's Holy Thursday. We should be celebrating the Lord's Supper. What are we doing? And so then like, you know, I went and then all of a sudden I was naked. And I was like looking for something. I was running around outside <laughs> looking for something, trying to avoid being seen by all these people that were in this house. And then Bishop Lopes was there and he was like, I'm taking over and I'm going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. But since we've already done all of those readings, let's not do any readings for Holy Thursday. And I was like, you can't do that. And he was arguing with me that it was okay. And then Staples made a sound and I woke up. These are the things that priests fear. Holy, I know, apparently. <laughs> this, is, this is their nightmares. <laughs> Liturgy gone awry. Whew. It was, yeah, apparently there was some anxiety or, you know, these anxiety dreams that, and that seems to be always where my, my anxiety, well, not always. I'm either being chased by someone who wants to kill me or uh, I'm like, liturgy has gone terrible. <laughs> these are these are the two things I fear the most. <laughs> wow. Hopefully the two never coincide. Yeah. <laughs> Bad liturgy and everyone kills me. <laughs> oh, good gravy. But the tomb is empty. It is. It still is. Yes. What did you do for Easter? So you skipped the vigil. Yeah, it you was were a... at the nine o'clock. I saw you there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's. It was a weird Holy Week because Jeremiah's birthday. He's only he just turned five. Okay. So his birthday was last Wednesday, March thirty first. So right before oh, Holy he's Thursday. He's almost an April Fool's baby. Yeah, we we were very thankful for that. <laughs> and then his cousin Arthur, his birthday was on Holy Saturday. Oh wow! Okay. And so we so did you have like birthday parties in the midst of all? Yeah. Of this? So. Wednesday is okay. It's Holy Week, but you're not getting into it. But then Saturday is when we celebrated their birthdays because they're still too young to really understand. And I know you can move it or whatever, but we celebrated it on Saturday, Absolutely. which is just right in the middle of the Triduum, which kind of is just like, eh. but then on Sunday we got together after, um, after going to mass, Yep. we got at everyone. your house at someone else's house. Sunday was at our house. And so we hosted a little brunch. Oh, and did you cook? Kind of. Bake, cook, kind of. 
we did these little sliders, so it's got egg and ham, a little oh, bit of honey. Like the little brunch foods. Yeah, and what yeah what brunch foods, yeah. Nice. So it was good. Nice, nice. Jonathan, did the Easter Bunny come? Yeah, we got, the kids had their baskets out, got some nice little treats. He brings me things. I always get a little chocolate bunny on every Easter. Oh, man. Another one of those little gold lint chocolate bunnies. Mm. The Easter Bunny knows I like that. So it's, I don't get much. I don't, you know, I don't need much. I don't want to go looking for eggs. When I was growing up, that was something the Easter Bunny never did at our house. He never hid eggs at our house. We usually got a little, our basket would appear on the, or did we put a basket out? I don't remember how that went. No, we didn't put anything out. But our basket, maybe we did. I don't remember. <laughs> maybe we put ba empty baskets out. Oh, we did, we did, we did. We each had our basket, and so we put our baskets out on the coffee table and filled them with the hay, and we put the colored eggs in the basket for the Easter Bunny. Oh. And then the Easter Bunny would come, and he would fill the, the baskets then with candy, and, and every once in a while there would be a little toy or something like that. I think I told you last year that my favorite was the, the time when there was a string attached to my Easter basket and the string ran under the couch and then behind the couch. And when you follow the string, there was Grimlock the Transformer. I do remember. Yeah, I was so excited because I wanted Grimlock so bad. He's the Tyrannosaurus Rex Transformer. I did not get that this year. No. But I got my chocolate bunny like usual. So thank you, Easter Bunny. Yeah. You know, my kids don't like chocolate, so they did not get any chocolate bunnies. Actually, Gemma likes chocolate, but... Good for her. She's not even two yet, so she doesn't need a whole chocolate bunny. No, that's true. My kids don't need any added sugar, caffeine, anything like Unlike that. Unlike you. No, I've been caffeine-free. about the free. added sugar and caffeine. I've been caffeine-free. We're at the... Yeah, you made it through. Did you make it through all of Lent? Yeah, no Red Bull. The whole... I never, I never asked you along the way. No Red Bull. Wow, you feel better. Yeah. Lots better. You didn't have any after Easter? No. No. I, it's over. It's done. No. That has died and we left it in the tomb. I did have some Coca-Cola. That's just well, a that's limited amount of uh, caffeine. You can get caffeine-free Coca-Cola. Oh, here we go with the I have taste a question. One. What? Does... I wonder what Coke uses to add caffeine. Because caffeine-free Coke and caffe caffeinated Coke... Taste very different. Do they? They do. I don't drink pop. And so I'm wondering because caffeine must not be flavorless then. But you'd think it would or be. Or it's flavorless. in something. It's in something. That go I don't know. I don't but know. We could research this, but if it could be flavorless or you know, like if it could taste exactly the same, I wouldn't mind drinking caffeine free. Yeah. Okay. I drink water, it's caffeine free. I drink Awa as well. <laughs> well, here we are in the Easter season. We kind of went yeah. through all of Triduum last time. And uh, you asked me before if I had a, a statue of the risen Christ because we had our crucifix up here during Lent. And then we covered it during Passion mm -hmm. Time. And then it's like, well, where's the statue of the resurrected Christ? There is no statue. The resurrected Christ statues drive me nuts. I mean, kind of, sort of. Me too. Oh. They always look weird. Yeah, it's a little too... Yeah. <laughs> there was one. I'll tell you about that later. But but <laughs> the church has a very particular symbol for the resurrected Christ. And that is... Doo -doo 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 -doo, the Easter candle. The Easter candle is the symbol for the resurrected Christ. So this is my little mini Easter candle here. So this is what you worked on for hours? No. I do make an Easter candle every year for church. But this one is my little travel one that I carry in my mass kit in case I have to celebrate mass somewhere, oh. you know, on the fly during the Easter season. So I take this one, goes in there, and I can take this one with me. The Easter candle is alive. It is uh, marked with the, the cross and five uh, wounds because Jesus, even when he was risen, uh, had his five wounds. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's marked with the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and end. And then usually the date is inscribed of the current year in there, that the Lord is the beginning, the end, and today. So today, yesterday, and today the same, forever. And uh, it doesn't look anything like Christ, but it's alive. And in order to be alive, it sacrifices itself. 
in order to live. And so the Easter candle represents the risen Christ. It looks nothing like him. It bears the wounds and it is alive through sacrifice. And that's Christ. Nobody recognized him when he was risen from the dead. And so during the Easter season, you'll notice that the Easter candle stands next to the ambo Mm -hmm. because that's where the gospel is proclaimed. So it's almost as if Christ himself is speaking to us now through all of the words. So when you go to Mass during the Easter season, look at that Easter candle, recognize the risen Christ, and hear his words coming at you. Which is also why then, normally during the gospel, two servers hold candles when the gospel is being proclaimed. During the Easter season, they do not hold candles because the Easter candle is already there burning by the ambo. The candle. The candle. Exactly. You know, those those servers holding those candles. When I do the live stream mass, it gets a little tricky. They sometimes, sometimes want to stand right in front of you. Oh yeah, it's a exactly. So, you have to kind of move things around. Yeah, so it's a little bit of a jolt for people. But right. you know, did you see that? Did you take a good look at the Easter candle that I painted for this year? A little bit. It's all about birds. It was very birdy. I was inspired by <laughs> birds this year. <laughs> well, there's a not there's a lot of symbolism. So right in the mid, so in play for the cross. I decided to do the tree of life this year. And so it's the cross, then that the branches, the cross beams break into branches, and then the, the all of the leafy green kind of grows out of there. And then the roots of the tree sink into the ground. And that tree of life image is very much like... I'm looking at it. <laughs> Thank you. That tree of life image <laughs> is uh, very much, it's, it's in the book of Revelation where it talks about the end of the book of Revelation, this tree planted in the center of the new city of Jerusalem that sinks its roots into the ground, and there's the river that flows, and from the river, all kinds of life spring forward. So you'll see on the candle a river that flows from the roots of this tree. And uh, the tree then also is tied to a scripture passage in Hosea, that the prophet talks once again about how God is going to raise up uh, and be like this tree that is watered and sinks its roots. It's like the trees of Lebanon, the cedars of Lebanon that sink their roots deep. Um, But then I was also thinking, well, Christ used the imagery of like this large shrub that grows out of a tiny little mustard seed. Mm -hmm. So at the base of the tree, there I've embedded a little mustard seed uh, so that you can see like the kingdom of God grows. It is this tree of life and it's tied to the cross. So the tree grows and it's large enough, as Christ said, that the birds of the air will find home in its branches and nest in its shade. And so you see two birds on the tree or on the candle. The one at the bottom is the pelican and the pelican is piercing its side. And there's a legend Uh, I don't think it's true, but there's a legend that says the pelican, uh, when it cannot find food for its young, will pierce its own uh, side and feed the young from its own flesh and blood. And so the pelican then became a symbol of Jesus Christ, Mm -hmm. who feeds us with his own flesh and blood. On the top of the tree, you'll see a peacock. And the peacock, there's an old legend, an old myth again, uh, that the peacock uh, lived forever that there is no, that the peacock's flesh does not decay. And so the peacock, Christians adopted the peacock as a symbol of the resurrection. So when you look at many of the old Christian tombs, you'll see peacocks on the tombs as symbols of the resurrection. So the death and resurrection of Christ are depicted. On the back side of the candle, to mark this is the year of St. Joseph, um, the rod of Jesse, the rod that flowers, and a bud shall blossom. And so here is the staff of St. Joseph, the the triple lilies there that symbolizes Joseph. And then right there in front of it, there are two little turtle doves uh, nesting. And those represent the the offering that Joseph brought to the temple when they offered Jesus uh, in accordance with the law. So again, the sacrifice that they made uh, to redeem their son the sacrifice that Christ made to redeem us. It's all tied together. Mm. So the the birds I thought would be symbolic and the the tree of life and kingdom of God and all that good stuff. Once you get going, it all starts weaving together into a tightly knit. Yeah. So that's this year's candle. I like it. Yeah, I enjoyed that. 
it was good, good to work on. I think I did that Monday of Passion Tide. I think I was telling you, it's, it's nice where, because I think most parishes go out and just buy their Easter candle. buy a candle. And they look nice. But, sure. Um, and they probably all have some kind of story behind them. Or if they're generic, yeah, it's the story is generic. what you explain. Yeah, exactly. You don't need much. That's a great – that sits on it by itself. Absolutely. It's a wonderful and amazing, the best story ever. So you don't really need to add to it. But it, get, right. it has more meaning when you added those things. And then you can explain, oh, well, this is – I'm trying to bring you deeper in. Yes. Yeah. You know, it gets you thinking and questioning. People look at that and say, what's the deal with the peacock? And then yeah. you have to go into that. When the, the ritual, when you make the Easter candle, because the Easter candle is created and blessed at the Easter vigil, uh, the, the, the ritual describes, you know, having a candle and taking a stylus and carving these symbols into the Easter candle. So if you think about it, and then embedding five grains of incense into the candle. So like... I guess the church's truest form of the Easter candle is a blank candle with the cross, the alpha, the omega, the numbers of the year uh, just carved into it without color, without oh, wow. ornamentation, uh, and then incense pressed into five holes that you would make into the candle. So, and there are some candles, you know, when you go to the cathedral uh, here in Omaha, the, the candle is just, it's this big white thing with no decoration on it. And I wonder, I've never gotten close to it to look, if that's what the Archbishop does, if he takes a stylus and carves into it. And yeah. uh, without, without any kind of fanfare, the candle speaks for itself, like you said. And you have to be close to it to see it. Right. That's the, again, I mean, there's all kinds of beauty in the, the Easter mysteries. Yeah. You talk a little bit about Revelation, and it kind of goes with, like, your Easter candle. If you don't have the explanation, you might be a little bit lost. Mm-hmm. The book of Revelation, Revelation is the probably the one of the few books of the Bible where I would say, if you don't have some kind of guide or anything, don't touch it <laughs> because you might it's just come out being not even thinking it's Catholic. Full of symbolism. Yes. Full of symbols, and so we're not talking about like this is what's going to happen at the end of time, or this is, but it's full of symbolism. We're going to read Revelation a lot during the Easter season, mm -hmm. so the Old Testament readings go away, and our first readings will come from either the Acts of the Apostles or the Book of Revelation. That's what we'll be listening to during the Easter season in place of uh, the Old Testament readings as our first reading at Mass. So we'll get, we'll get intimately connected with Acts and Revelation. It's just a nice... Uh, it's just, everything's alive again. It is. It it's is so, so joyful. Good. The birds are chirping outside, literally. Yep, I can hear them. Can you hear them? We got one. <laughs> he won't respond. No. Yeah, story of my life. <laughs> so the year is, you know, it was so good to have Trivium, to have Easter with everybody back. That was, uh, that was just a nice, nice feeling. So different from last Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Easter Vigil and Easter where, you know, there's an empty church and you're celebrating these great moments of new life and nobody was there. This is much better. Yes. This is much better. Yeah. Having my own personal masses for the Trito <laughs> wasn't quite... Yeah, because you were filming. You were behind yeah, the camera the whole time. I was behind time. the camera or lecturing or running around because we had to... You had to do you know, everything. Just, yeah, so it was just... It's a this is how it's supposed to be. Exactly. With people feeling, you know, joy or the sadness. It's, we're communal people. It's good to see that coming back. Yeah. And we know that the Archbishop has called for uh, the Pentecost weekend now at the end of, of Easter to be the time where everybody makes their way back to the altar. Mm -hmm. uh, unless you are sick or have uh, the inability to attend or, um, you know, in danger uh, vulnerable and in danger of, of uh, getting seriously ill from COVID-19, that we should be in a place where it's safe enough for everybody to make their return. Yeah. So the general dispensation will be lifted here in the state of Nebraska. All three bishops are going to do that on Pentecost weekend, at which time we will also cease the uh, live streaming of the liturgies. We'll still provide 
Uh, you know, we're never going to go completely away. Well, I want to be in your homes. So <laughs> we're never going to go completely away, but uh, we're not going to be substituting. There are, there are resources for those who are homebound, EWTN, master shut-ins. Um, but we really do want to make sure everybody gets back to the table of the Lord and right. participates together. And so just for clarification, that means that the dispensation is lifted, meaning that is the we- that you must attend Mass that weekend. It's not after that. That is a good question, because I'm not sure how to read the wording of the, the thing. <laughs> because it says that, 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 that the dispensation... I don't remember what it says, ends on or is until or is lifted after. I'm not sure. That's really... But so it's like, I don't know if that means on that weekend or the next weekend it would be obligatory. I'm assuming Pentecost is obligatory. That is my read of it from talking to the Archbishop. That is my read of what he is saying, that it is the birthday of the church it is when the church is manifest and visible, and we want to be visible again in the world. And so that is the day when, if we have not yet made it. And, you know, I think this will apply to very few people, mm-hmm. because already we're almost, if not already, at uh, normal numbers for what we had yeah. before a pandemic. Now, I know there's still a lot out there who aren't making their weekly uh, trip to the, to the altar, Uh, and probably need to uh, be evangelized a little bit. But if we can get at least back those that were coming, and then we can continue working on inviting those that yet have not found the Lord as deeply. Yeah. And speaking of evangelizing those, we had a video project that recently came through. What? Yeah. We did. And um, so we want to share, just as we close the show today, we'll probably... Play oh, a little bit of a, a welcome to St. Charles Borromeo video. Yeah. Because um, we're releasing it today. So if you happen to be walking through the neighborhoods and see a sign advertising St. Charles and you click a QR code that's on it, this is the video you're going to see. A church sign in a front yard. With a QR code? How curious. Was it curiosity that brought you here? A sort of restlessness? Perhaps just a longing for more? Nothing happens by chance or coincidence. God is calling. Welcome to St. Charles Borromeo. Here We answer God's call by learning together, by praying together, by celebrating together, by serving together. The only thing we don't have is you.